Hey everyone, today I'm going to walk you through all of the Ulduar bosses and trash as a tank. The first thing you need to know is that bosses in Ulduar hit much harder than phase 1 bosses, so you'll want to adjust your gear, gems, enchants, talents, and glyphs to be as tanky as possible. This raid not only has a 25 and 10 man version, but nearly all of the bosses have between 2 to 5 different difficulty levels. I'll point out the differences between difficulties and raid sizes as we go along. Let's get right into it. The first boss in Ulduar is Flame Leviathan, which is a vehicle fight. This fight has five different difficulties. You can talk to Bran immediately to start the easy mode version of the fight, aka Zero Tower, or you can talk to Lorekeeper of Norganon to activate the hardest mode, aka Four Tower. Talking to the Lorekeeper of Norganon will activate four towers, and the number of towers you choose to leave up determines the difficulty level of the fight. These towers will be off to the left and right side as you clear to Flame Leviathan, and by simply destroying them with your siege attacks, you will disable them and reduce the difficulty of the Flame Leviathan encounter. Each tower left up will increase Flame Leviathan and his adds health by 40%, as well as add another mechanic and buff or debuff to the fight. The green tower reduces Flame Leviathan's fire damage taken by 10%, and spawns adds from green beams in the corners of the room. The blue tower reduces player vehicle movement speed by 20% and causes light blue beams to follow players around that drop a ball of frost on them that freezes them if hit and deals damage over time. Frozen players can be broken out with fire attacks. The red tower increases Flame Leviathan's fire damage by 50% and causes balls of fire to drop in a line that deal damage on impact and leave behind a damaging ground effect. And the yellow tower increases physical damage done by Flame Leviathan and adds by 25% and causes dark blue beams to spawn that drop balls of lightning, damaging players underneath. Flame Leviathan's base abilities are Battering Ram, Gather Speed, Flame Vents, and Missile Barrage. You will target one Demolisher or Siege Engine and attempt to catch up to them and Battering Ram them. While being pursued, you just need to run away to avoid this and he'll switch targets every 30 seconds. Gather Speed is a stacking movement speed buff that Flame Leviathan frequently gets. Flame Vents is a channeled AoE dealing fire damage every second. This should be interrupted immediately by a Siege Engine. Missile Barrage shoots missiles at random players, dealing a small amount of damage. Flame Leviathan has turrets on top of him that, when killed, cause a system shutdown that stuns him, removes all stacks of Gathering Speed, and causes him to take 50% increased damage for a short time. The turrets cannot be killed by Siege Vehicles, Players must be launched onto Flame Leviathan by a Demolisher to kill them. There are three different types of vehicles you might be in. Siege Engines, Demolishers, or Choppers, and Vehicle Damage and Health Scales with Eye Level. The Demolisher Drivers should be the highest eye level people in your raid, but they also need to be competent. A good player with a lower eye level is always going to be a better choice than a bad player with a higher eye level. The Siege Engine has three abilities. Ram, which has a 15 yard range and deals frontal cone damage, Electroshock, which has a 25 yard range and interrupts cast, and Steam Rush, that gives a large movement speed buff for a short time and deals damage and knocks back enemies in your path. The Siege Engine has an energy resource, so make sure you're always pulling enough of it to be able to interrupt. The primary job of the Siege Engine is to interrupt flame vents. Since Flame Leviathan has a pretty big hitbox and both Electroshock and Ram have decent range, you can be pretty far away from Flame Leviathan and still reliably hit him. If you have the Green Tower active, you should also try to tank the adds to keep them off Demolishers. The Siege Engine also has a turret that another player can hop into. This turret can shoot anti-air rockets into the sky to knock down the flying blue pyrite containers. You can also use Fire Cannon to do fire damage to ground targets. Its final ability is Shield Generator, which will absorb some damage for the Siege Engine. Next is the Demolisher, which is the main damage dealer in this fight. It has four abilities, Hurl Boulder, Hurl Pyrite Barrel, Ram, and Throw Passenger. Hurl Boulder deals a moderate amount of AoE damage where it lands. Hurl Pyrite Barrel is the most important ability of any of the vehicles. You'll use this to stack up a damage over time effect on Flame Leviathan that stacks to 10 and does significantly more damage than anything else in this encounter. Your primary goals as a Demolisher are to keep a 10 stack of Pyrite rolling on Flame Leviathan at all times and launch people onto Flame Leviathan when the turrets are up. Pyrite is a limited resource. The only way to replenish it is by having a passenger grab a blue pyrite container for you off the ground, which will restore 25 pyrite. 
A good Demolisher driver will be able to maintain their pyrite stacks even when being pursued by Flame Leviathan. Just do quick turns to throw pyrite at them to keep your stacks going. Ram is another ability you have that will do a small amount of damage and knock back mobs. Useful for adds that get too close. The last ability, Throw Passenger, is usable once a passenger has used their load into Catapult ability. You'll be able to launch them onto Flame Leviathan so they can destroy the turrets and cause a system shutdown. A Demolisher Passenger will have the abilities Mortar, Anti-Air Rocket, Grab Crate, Increase Speed, and Load into Catapult. Grab Crate and Load into Catapult were mentioned before. They are used to pick up pirate containers off the ground and load players into the Catapult respectively. The Demolisher Passenger needs to actually target the pirate container before using Grab Crate. The Anti-Air Rocket, like the Siege Engine Passenger one, allows them to shoot pirate out of the sky so it can be picked up on the ground. Mortar will do a good amount of damage based on a target's distance to the explosion. Increased speed will make the demolisher move much faster for 20 seconds, but cost pyrite, so the passenger needs to be careful using this or they can prevent the demolisher driver from maintaining their pyrite 10 stack. The final vehicle is the chopper. This is a fast moving vehicle with the abilities sonic horn, tar, speed boost, grab pyrite, and first aid kit. Sonic horn will do a small amount of damage in a frontal cone. Tar will drop tar on the ground that slows enemies, and fire attacks used on the tar will set it on fire and damage enemies that touch it. If you have the green tower up, choppers should be assigned to keeping tar down at each corner where adds spawn, and tar should be ignited by a demo or siege engine. Speed boost will cost energy but allow you to move twice as fast for 5 seconds. Grab pyrite allows the chopper to move pyrite to a more easily accessible spot for demolishers to pick up. Just press the eject button once you've found a good spot for it. The final ability is first aid kit, which will heal your passenger. Choppers are used to pick up players that were launched onto Flame Leviathan to kill turrets. These players should be marked and choppers should be assigned to a specific mark and take them back to their demolisher. Before the fight, you'll clear through a bunch of adds. These don't really do much, just AoE them down and destroy towers in your way to stop dwarves from spawning. Once you get past the area with all the towers, you'll see large circles on the ground that will heal your vehicle. Once you clear the two giants by the gate at the end, Flame Leviathan will spawn. But before engaging Flame Leviathan, shoot a bunch of pyrite out of the sky so you have a bunch ready for the fight. It will not despawn. This fight seems complicated at first, but it really isn't too bad once you get in there and experience it for yourself. The keys to this fight are causing system shutdowns as quickly as possible, all demolishers keeping 10 stacks of pyrite on flame leviathan at all times, interrupting flame vents, and running away from flame leviathan when he pursues you. If you have towers active, manage adds well, and dodge beams. Now that we've gotten past Flame Leviathan, we actually get to play our characters. You now have a choice of which boss you want to fight next out of Razor Scale, Ignis, and XT, but we'll start with Razor Scale. He's going to be off to your right as you go down the hallway after Flame Leviathan, and there is no trash to clear to him. This is a normal mode only fight, and you can either solo or two tank it on both 10 and 25 man. You can start this fight by talking to the Expedition Commander. In the first part of the fight, you're waiting for the dwarves to get the turrets ready to bring Razor Scale down out of the sky. On the far side of the room, Dark Iron Dwarves will tunnel up out of the ground during this time and need to be picked up. Each wave will have three separate spawns, so make sure you grab everything. MDs and Tricks are great here. There are two types of small dwarves, guardians and watchers. Guardians will just storm strike which can be cleansed, and watchers cast lightning bolt and chain lightning which should be interrupted. There's another larger mob called a sentinel that whirlwinds for a lot of damage, so melee should be careful if you're solo tanking this. All these adds die extremely quickly, so there isn't much time for their abilities to actually cause problems. Once all of the turrets are ready to go, a designated person in your raid will activate them by clicking them. This will bring Razor Scale down out of the sky, but at this point he doesn't need to be tanked. Just do as much damage as you can. If you're a prop pally, you can use Hand of Reckoning for extra damage here since he doesn't have a target. You'll have 45 seconds to DPS him before he flies in the air again, and you'll once again be fighting Dark Iron Dwarves until turrets are ready to go. This will repeat until Razor Scale reaches 50%, at which point he will voluntarily land. Most raids should be able to get him to 50% in one grounded phase with Lust. If you don't get him to 50% in one grounded phase, you may run into issues with his 6 minute Berserk timer. 
Solo tanking will allow you to have an extra DPS and increase your chances of getting him down in one grounded phase. Once Razor Scale has reached 50%, he will knock back all players within 35 yards and need to be tanked. He has a breath attack, so make sure to face him away from the raid. Use Armor will reduce the tank's armor, attack, and movement speed by 20% per stack, stacking up to 5 times. If you're solo tanking, just save damage reduction cooldowns for when you have 2 or more stacks. If you're 2 tanking, the off tank should taunt when the main tank has 2 stacks. Razor Skill will occasionally throw fire at a player and it will leave behind a patch of blue fire on the ground. Just keep an eye on this and move the boss if it's causing issues for your melee. Next, we'll take a look at Ignis. He's going to be right across the hallway from Razor Skill. There are several trash packs that need to be killed before you fight Ignis. First, you'll see two Molten Colossi. These can pretty easily be solo tanked on 10 man, but I'd use two tanks for them on 25 man until you're more geared. He'll put a stacking debuff on tanks that reduces armor and causes fire damage over time, and also cast an AoE 4 second silence with a huge range. He'll also cast Unquenchable Flames on players, which is a fire dot that will hop between players and can only be removed by getting into water. Go down the ramp and you'll see water on the left and right sides of the room that can be used to remove the debuff. There will also be Forge Constructs and Magma Ragers patrolling the room. Magma Ragers will summon a Fire Tornado that does an AoE knockback. Forge Constructs will do a Frontal Breath and charge far away players. Now for Ignis himself. This is another normal mode only fight and it can be either solo or two tanked on both 10 and 25 man. Ignis has two main abilities to be aware of as a tank. Scorch, which will set the area of the floor on fire where the tank is standing when the spell is cast. The second ability is Activate Construct, which will activate one of the constructs lined up around the room. For each construct alive, Ignis will gain a stack of Strength of the Creator, increasing his damage by 20%. If you're solo tanking, save damage reduction cooldowns for later in the fight when stacks are higher. These constructs need to be picked up either by an off tank or the main tank if you're solo tanking. You can get these MD'd to you if you're solo tanking to make things easier. If you're solo tanking, you're just going to hold on to these constructs for the rest of the fight. If you're two tanking, the off tank who picks them up will then tank them in the fire on the ground created by Scorch. The construct will stack up a debuff as it sits in the fire, and at 10 stacks, the construct will turn molten, which increases its haste and deals fire damage to players around it. Now the construct needs to be taken into water, and it will become a brittle construct. It should be taken to the water away from the raid. Once it is brittle, it will be stunned and have an increased chance to be crit. Once it has been hit with a single attack for 5,000 or more damage, it will explode for a lot of damage. So make sure nobody is near it when it's killed. The main tank will want to tank Ignis so he's facing the water on either side of the room. When he casts Scorch, no fire will spawn on the ground if he casts it into water. If you're solo tanking, you won't move from this position for the whole fight. If you're two tanking, the main tank needs to rotate 90 degrees away from the water every other Scorch so that there will be a fire patch available for the off tank to heat up the golems. Ignis will also occasionally cast Flame Jets, which will knock you in the air. Next up is XT. He's going to be at the end of the long hallway that we turned left and right at to get to Ignis and Razor Scale. There are two identical trash packs to clear before we fight him. Group all of these up and AoE them down. The large compacto bots will randomly charge people. The gnomes will cast Defense Matrix, a yellow bubble that reduces damage taken. Just move the mobs out of these as soon as they cast it. Sawblades will also be spawned that cannot be tanked and fly around. DPS just need to kill these. Now for XT himself. He has two difficulties and can either be solo or two tanked on both 10 and 25 man. You'll need to solo tank this if you're doing hard mode or you likely won't have the damage to beat the Berserk timer. At 75%, 50%, and 25% there will be heart phases where XT's heart comes out and can be DPS'd. It will take 100% increased damage. Killing the heart will put XT back to 100% HP and activate hard mode. If the heart isn't killed, any damage done to it will damage XT for the same amount. During heart phase, adds will spawn from the scrap piles far away from XT. The only add we need to worry about as tanks are pommelers. Just get these MD'd to you and or taunt them as they get close. Make sure your healers aren't too far away so you can easily taunt the pommelers before they reach them. Range DPS will handle the bomb bots and scrap bots on their own. If you're doing hard mode, there will only be one set of adds because there will only be one heart phase. 
XT will periodically cast Tantrum, which does damage equal to 10% of each player's HP a second. It's good to use cooldowns such as Divine Sacrifice to reduce raid damage during this time. He also has two debuffs he'll periodically put out on players, Searing Light and Gravity Bomb. Tanks cannot be targeted by Gravity Bomb, but your fellow raiders will just be running away from everyone when they get that. If it's hard mode, they'll also drop a Void Zone on the ground when the debuff expires. Searing Light is an AoE dot, so just make sure you're max range so you don't hit melee with this if you get it. On hard mode, a Light Spark add will spawn when the debuff expires, so keep an eye on people with Searing Light so you're ready to pick up the add immediately when it spawns. It will do a bit of AoE damage around it until it's killed. If these start to pile up on you, just pop a defensive cooldown. Now you can enter the Antechamber. And here you'll see a pack of Dwarves and Golems. You can group all of these up and AoE them down. The Menders should be interrupted and killed first. Golems will cast Hardened Fist, which doubles their damage and roots them in place. You can pop a defensive for this if you want. Make sure you don't move out of melee range when they're rooted because they'll just turn and one-shot someone else in range. Next, you'll see two rune-etched sentries. Think these facing away from the raid as they'll do a frontal cone attack. If you're two tanking these, tanks can stack up and tank them at slightly different angles so both tanks don't get hit by both flame jets. They also put a red rune on the ground dealing damage over time, just don't stand in that. Once you clear this hallway, you'll see more dwarves and there will be a chamber overseer on each side that patrol to the pack and then away. You can pull these without pulling the pack, just make sure you pull things back to the hallway so you don't accidentally pull more. Chamber Overseers have a frontal cone attack, just face them away. They'll also occasionally leap and summon a lightning ball which will follow a player. Either heal through this or the player can kite it away. From here, you have options on what boss you go to again. To the left is Iron Council, to the right is Algalon, and up the stairs is Kolagarn. You won't actually be able to go to Algalon at this time if it's your first time in here and nobody has the key. Let's take a look at Iron Council first. This fight has three different difficulty levels based on which boss you kill last. It can be either solo or two tanked on 10 man. On 25 man, you'll want to two tank it, but it may eventually be possible to solo tank it. The easy mode is killing the small boss, Brundir, last. The medium mode is killing the medium boss, Molgheim, last. And the hard mode is killing the large boss, Steelbreaker, last. Each time a boss is killed, the remaining bosses gain a new ability and a plus 25% damage buff. The medium and hard mode will reward you with the Archivum data disc, which begins the quest for the key to open the door to Algalon, so I tried to always at least do the medium mode if you can. If you're using two tanks, the higher survivability tank should be tanking Steelbreaker, and the lower survivability tank should be on Mulgheim and Brundir. Make sure you have Aspect of the Wild or Nature Resist Totem for this fight, as there is a ton of nature damage. The typical kill order for hard mode is Brundir, then Molgheim, then Steelbreaker, and Steelbreaker, then Brundir, then Molgheim for medium mode. Brundir will occasionally cast Overload, which will do AoE damage around him after 6 seconds, so just make sure to move away when he's casting this. He also has a Chain Lightning that should be interrupted. If another boss dies, he will gain Lightning Whirl, which does AoE damage and needs to be interrupted. It's unlikely you'll ever kill him last and deal with these mechanics, but if a second boss dies, he will gain Lightning Tendrils and Storm Shield. Lightning Tendrils causes him to fly in the air and do AoE damage to anyone close. He'll randomly change targets, so he just needs to be kited away from people. Storm Shield makes him immune to stun. Mulgheim will cast Rune of Power on a random boss. This increases the damage of players and bosses inside it by 50%. It's important to move bosses out of this immediately, especially Steelbreaker. Steelbreaker can be really annoying to move out of this due to his hitbox. I'll have a weak aura in the description that pops up a big icon if your target is in Rune of Power. It does have a short cast time, so if you're paying attention to the cast, you can begin to move bosses before it's actually on the ground so they're already out of it when it goes down. You'll want to position bosses in such a way that all your DPS can stand in the Rune of Power and DPS the bosses, but the bosses aren't close enough that they also get the Rune of Power buff. After one boss has been killed, Mulgheim will gain the Rune of Death ability. This will create a large ground effect that damages anyone inside of it and lasts for a while. This is cast on a random player, so you'll want people to stand away from new runes of power until a rune of death is cast so that you don't make the rune of power unusable by covering it with a death rune. 
If Mulgheim is the last one to die, aka medium mode, they'll gain Rune of Summoning. Rune of Summoning will create a rune that spawns lightning elementals that explode when they reach their target, dealing 10k on 10 man and 15k on 25 man to anyone within 30 yards. The main tank should move away from these runes and ranged will focus them down. These adds can be slowed, rooted, and stunned. Dropping a frost trap on the rune helps a lot. Steelbreaker will cast Fusion Punch, which does 35k nature damage on 25 man and 20k on 10 man, and puts a magic debuff on the target that deals 20k nature damage a second on 25 man and 15k on 10 man for 4 seconds. When bosses have died and given the damage buff, this damage will go through the roof. It's important to have a priest shielding you as this is being cast. Fusion Punch has a 3 second cast time, so you have plenty of time to prepare for it. Try to have a defensive CD of some sort up for each Fusion Punch in Phase 3, and as many as you can in Phase 2. Fusion Punch damage is resistible, so you can use a Resist Flask and Nature Resist Helm Enchant and Cloak Enchant in addition to Aspect of the Wild or Nature Resist Totem to reduce damage. If you have all of those things, you'll have 225 Nature Resist, and at 219 nature resist, we reach a breakpoint where the smallest amount we can resist is 20%. Prop Pallies are great steel breaker tanks since they can just cleanse their own fusion punch, and Ardent Defender is great in general. If a prop pally is not tanking steel breaker, it's really important to have someone who is very fast at cleansing assigned to get this debuff off the tank immediately. The tank will usually die if fusion punch isn't instantly cleansed. Once one of the other bosses dies, Steelbreaker will gain Static Disruption, which does several thousand nature damage and increases nature damage taken by 75%. This is cast on players at range and won't really be a concern for the tank. Once the second boss dies, Steelbreaker will gain the ability Meltdown, a debuff he places on the tank which increases their damage done by 200%, but causes them to die and do 30k damage to anyone within 15 yards when the debuff expires. This will ignore Ardent Defender and Guardian Spirit and kill the tank anyway. On 10 man, this debuff lasts 1 minute, which will be plenty of time for most groups to kill Steelbreaker before the tank dies. On 25 man, Meltdown will last 25 seconds, so until groups are very geared, another tank will be needed to taunt Steelbreaker when the debuff is close to expiring. When Steelbreaker is taunted off of you, make sure you get 15 yards away from everyone so you don't kill anyone. Steelbreaker tanks that will die should either have a soulstone or get battle res. In phase 3, Steelbreaker also heals for 20% every time a player dies. If you're doing the hard mode, you'll want to get Mulgam to very low HP and wait for him to cast a new rune of power before killing him. The 25 man hard mode is a major DPS check, so you want to maximize rune of power uptime during this phase. On 10 man, this is a lot less important than on 25. Prop Pallies will also likely want to use Wings for extra damage during Meltdown instead of Wall to help meet the DPS check. The next boss in the Antechamber is Kolagarn. He's just up the stairs and there's no trash. This fight is normal mode only. It can be solo tanks pretty easily on 10 man, but if you're having any issues, you can use a second tank. On 25 man, solo tanking should eventually be possible, but I recommend using two tanks early on. In this encounter, you'll be fighting Kolagarn's torso and arms, which all have different health bars. When an arm is killed, the torso will lose 15% HP. The fight is over when the torso dies. When tanking him, just make sure you're in melee range at all times, or else your fellow raiders will die. Your DPS will all be focusing on the right arm, which will be on your left side when facing him, because this arm will pick people up and won't drop them until a certain damage threshold is reached. So it's best to just have all the DPS already on that arm to begin with. When an arm dies, several earth elementals will spawn. On 10 man, they don't do much, but on 25 man, they will cast Stone Nova, which does AoE damage around them and applies a stacking debuff that increases physical damage taken by 5% per stack. These will be picked up by the off tank if you're two tanking, or you if you're solo tanking. On 25 man, they should be tanked away from the raid, but close enough to Kolagarn for cleave effects to hit them. Position under an arm that's about to die when you're picking these up, so you can get them as soon as they spawn. Kolagarn will also cast Overhead Smash, which does damage and puts the Crunch Armor debuff on the tank. This debuff stacks and reduces armor by 20% per stack on 10 man and 25% per stack on 25 man. If you're 2 tanking, the off tank can taunt when this reaches 2 to 3 stacks on the main tank. If you're solo tanking, you'll want to start using defensives after it reaches 2 to 3 stacks. 
Bulgarn also has an eye beam that will chase players. Just run away from this. You will die if you fall off the ledge into the area Kologarn is standing in, so don't do that. The next area is the observation ring, where you'll see the entrances to all of the keepers' rooms. There are two storm-tempered keepers in front of these entrances. These should be tanked away from one another because they'll periodically summon a spark that will travel towards the other keeper, buffing its damage if the spark isn't killed. They have a frontal cone attack, so face them away from the raid. If the mobs are pulled too far away from each other, they will get a damage buff. When one of the keepers is killed, the remaining one will get a damage and attack speed buff, so you want them to die at about the same time. Oriaya is a normal mode only boss who patrols in front of all of the keepers' entrances. As you're pulling the storm-tempered keepers, make sure you're pulling them back a bit and keeping an eye on Oriaya's patrol so you don't accidentally pull her while killing trash. You'll also want to fight Oriaya in an area away from Trash because she has a fear that could potentially cause people to pull more things. This fight can be solo or two tanked on both 10 and 25 man, but it will be easier to two tank it your first time. The most difficult part of this fight is the pull. The Sanctum sentries that patrol with her buff the other sentries damage by 50% each. If you do the pull wrong, all of these buffed cats will use Savage Pounce on you or someone else in Instagib. They only use their pounce on people out of melee range. There are several ways to pull her, but we found the most reliable way was to have the entire raid stacked up together out of line of sight and have a hunter MD everything to the tank out of line of sight with trap or volley. If you don't have a hunter with you, sending out a ghoul or a lock pet or using an instant attack to pull and immediately LOSing also works. I recommend using defensive CDs on the pull in case anything goes wrong. Everyone should stay stacked up until all of the sentries are dead, then it will be safe for the main tank to move. Oriaya will periodically cast Terrifying Screech, which will fear the whole raid, so non-warrior tanks should have Fear Ward or be in a Tremor Totem group. This fear is also dispellable. She'll cast Sonic Screech occasionally too, which does about 200,000 damage on 25 man in a cone split amongst any one hit. There are a few ways of dealing with this. Either have the entire raid stacked up behind Oriaya with the main tank opposite, and the tank will move when she casts this so it hits the whole raid. Alternatively, you can have all the range and healers stacked behind the tank and the melee just DPS behind the boss all fight. Or the entire raid can be stacked up together, including the main tank. She'll also cast Sentinel Blast, which does about 5k shadow damage and puts a stacking plus 100% shadow damage taken debuff every second on the raid. This just needs to be interrupted immediately. She'll also periodically summon a bunch of small cats that just need to be AoE'd down. They die almost instantly. About a minute in, she'll summon a Feral Defender. This mob drops threat constantly, but can be taunted. The raid should kill it immediately, but it will drop a Void Zone on the ground when it's killed. It'll be running around, pouncing all over the raid until you kill it. You can either kill it away from the raid to drop the Void Zones in a safe spot, or just kill it and move away from wherever the Void Zone happens to be. PKs can also grip it out to a good spot. If you're two tanking, the off tank will be in charge of wrangling this and moving it to a safe spot for it to die. The Feral Defender will respawn after about 40 seconds every time it's killed until it loses all charges of Feral Essence, which is really unlikely unless you're doing the achievement. Oriaya will just keep rotating through all of her abilities until you kill her. The icy area will lead you to Hodir. There's a bit of trash to clear first to get to him. You'll see snow piles on the ground as you go through this area. Going near them will cause a bunch of Jormungar to spawn one by one. Someone always triggers these in my experience, so I would just hit all of them and AoE everything down all at once instead of trying to avoid them. You'll fight a champion of Hodir as you enter this area. Your raid should spread out a bit as these will pick a random target and do a breath that stuns the target and people around them. You'll next fight a pat that has a Winter Revenant and some Winter Rumblers. The Rumblers will take reduced AoE damage until the Revenant is killed, so kill it first. The Revenant also casts a Blizzard and Whirlwind that knocks back, so position near a wall. There will be a second Revenant and Rumbler patrol at the second Giant. You can wait for it to pat away and pull the Giant back to avoid the pat, or you can just run in and fight all of them. If you choose to fight all of them at once, kill the Revenant, then the Giant. Odir is a solo tank fight on all modes and difficulties. The hard mode for this boss is to kill him within 2 minutes, nothing else. There are no new mechanics on hard mode, you just have to be really good about using his normal mechanics to beat the timer. 
When you enter his room, you'll see a bunch of frozen NPCs. Your raid is going to want to break all of these out immediately because they give huge damage buffs that will allow you to beat the timer for hard mode. The mage NPC will put down a toasty fire that gives spells a chance to apply the singed debuff, a stacking debuff that increases spell damage taken. It's really important for your raid to stack this up immediately and keep it up. The druid NPCs will cast Starlight, which is a pillar of light that increases attack and cast speed of any player standing in it by 50%. The main thing you'll be doing as a tank is positioning in such a way that your melee can stand in one of these starlights while attacking Hodir from behind. Sometimes the starlight will be positioned in such a way that you'll be able to stand in one of your own while the melee are in another one and able to attack from behind. This is ideal when it works out, but the priority is just getting good starlight positioning for your melee. The Shaman NPCs will periodically cast Stormcloud on someone, which gives a huge crit damage buff to the first 6 players you move near on 25 man and 4 on 10 man. If this buff happens to be cast on you, it's important that you move around to spread it to your top DPS as quickly as possible. Utilizing all 3 of these NPC buffs to their full potential is how you will have enough damage to beat the 2 minute hard mode timer. As for what Hodir himself will do, he has an aura like the final boss in Nexus that puts up a stacking dot that can be removed by any kind of movement or by standing near a toasty fire. Icicles will periodically fall from the ceiling, just don't stand in the small bluish white circles on the ground. Hodir will periodically cast Flash Freeze, which will cause large bluish white circles to appear on the ground. You initially need to stand just outside of these, but move on top of them once they're covered in snow. Being on top of the snow will allow you to avoid being frozen from flash freeze, which will occur seconds after you get on top of the snow. If you fail to get onto the snow in time, you'll be frozen in an ice block and your fellow raiders will have to break you out. The NPCs will all get frozen again from flash freeze and need to be broken out. You'll occasionally get frost nova throughout the fight too, but this should get mass dispelled either by a priest NPC or a priest in your raid. Odir's final ability is Frozen Blows, which significantly reduces his physical damage, but causes his attacks to do 40k frost damage for 20 seconds on 25 man and 31k on 10 man. You will cast this after Flash Freeze. As long as you're using Frost Resist Aura or Totem and Defensive CDs, this isn't too big of a deal. Frost Resist Aura Mastery is a great CD here. You can use Frost Resist Enchants and a Resist Flask if you want to, but I haven't found it necessary. Just past Hodir's area, you'll find Thorum's area. There's another set of storm-tempered keepers in front of the door. Please back a bit because there's a pat that can aggro if you fight in the doorway. The two patrols consist of a Dark Rune Thunderer and a Dark Rune Ravager. The Ravager will stack a Sunder on you that reduces armor by 5% per stack, and the Thunderer has a nature damage attack that puts a plus 40% nature damage taken debuff on you. In higher DPS groups, these can easily be solo tanked, but if your group is lacking DPS, you can have one tank on each and do a taunt swap once stacks get to around 7 or 8. Now for Thorum. This fight has a normal and hard mode and is generally two tanked, but can potentially be solo tanked on both 10 and 25. Solo tanking requires a lot of resilience because Thorum will put a debuff on you, reducing your defense by 200, increasing your chance to be crit by 8%. You'll need 13.6% reduced chance to be crit to make up for this, or 7.6% if you're a Feral Druid. Since Feral Druids get 6% reduced chance to be crit from talents, they're generally going to be the one solo tanking this. But it should eventually be doable by all tanks with the right gear. You'll see some mobs fighting in Thorum's arena. Face the giant Jormungar away because he has a breath attack. These mobs don't do much else and can just be AoE'd down. Once you've killed all of these mobs, phase 1 of Thorum will begin. This is an ad phase with two areas. One group will stay in the arena and fight dwarves, while another group will go into the tunnel and work their way to Thorum. Anyone in the arena should stand near the middle to make ad pickups easier for you. These adds do almost nothing and can just be grouped up and AoE down. Focus mainly on picking up the champion, warbringer, and evoker before the commoners. The evoker should be interrupted. Melee DPS should be the ones with you in the arena. As for the tunnel group, someone will need to click the lever to the left of the tunnel to open up the gate. This group should be all ranged because the adds do some big AoEs that will kill melee easily. At the end of the tunnel, there's a runic colossus that will do a shockwave attack to one half of the room, like Scotty and Utgard Pinnacle. It's easiest if you have one person calling this out for everyone. You can tell which side is about to be hit based on which of his hands is glowing. He'll continue doing this until you pull him. 
You'll see I went a little bit crazy and pulled multiple packs for testing, but on 25 man, you probably just want to go one pack at a time. The Acolytes heal and need to be interrupted. When you pull the Runic Colossus, just face away from the group and step to the side when he casts Smash. This is a frontal cone attack, just like the final boss in Utgard Keep. Once you kill him, the door will open and you'll fight more dwarves. Move up the stairs and you'll fight an ancient rune giant. It will occasionally put a debuff on someone that makes them unable to move and they AoE anyone around them. So people just need to spread out. After killing him, the door will open and you'll need to hug the wall and head to Thorum. If you run through the middle, you'll be stunned for a long time. Reach Thorum within 3 minutes to activate the hard mode. If you're just trying to do normal mode, you'll need to wait around for a little bit until the timer expires if you got there too quickly. When you hit Thorum, phase 2 will begin. Thorum will jump into the arena and will need to be picked up by a tank immediately. The main ability to be aware of as a tank is Unbalancing Strike, which reduces defense by 200, making us critical in normal sets. Unbalancing Strike has a 15 second cooldown, but he doesn't always cast it immediately. When he casts Unbalancing Strike on the main tank, the off tank needs to taunt him. Make sure you have either target of target debuffs on or set the other tank as your focus so you can easily see when they have the debuff and taunt immediately. On the final version of PTR, the 15 second cooldown on Unbalancing Strike was sometimes causing issues with taunt DRing and Thorum going immune to it. I think this will get changed, but if this is still happening when this goes live, you'll want to delay your taunts by a few seconds if he casts it right when it comes off cooldown. Tanks will be stacked together on the side of the room that Thorum jumped down from. His chain lightning is very dangerous and can jump an infinite number of times with damage increasing every jump like the Cthune Beam. It's important that the tanks and all melee groups are spread into four points and each group is stacked right on top of each other to avoid chain lightning deaths. Thorum will also frequently draw power from the orbs around the room. You'll see lightning going from Thorum to the orb and then it'll do a cone AoE in that area. As tanks, we don't need to worry about the AoE, but each time he does this, he's going to get a stacking buff that increases his melee damage and attack speed by 15% and nature damage by 10%. He will hit really hard once his buff stacks get high, so save your defensive CDs for sub 50%. Start with weaker ones so you have your best defensive for the final time you tank him. Time your defensive CD usage so that they're likely to be up at the time he uses Unbalancing Strike on you, because an Unbalancing Strike into a crit is the most likely way you'll die. When you're off tanking, you can also help out the main tank with things like Hand of Sacrifice or Talented Intervene. Next to Thorum's room, you'll find Freya's room. There's quite a bit of trash in here, but it doesn't pull when you engage her, so only kill trash around the area you'll be fighting her. There are also three elder mini bosses around the room. These will be giant trees. Similar to Obsidian Sanctum, Freya has four difficulties that are based on how many elders are alive when you pull her. Elder Brightleaf will increase magic damage dealt by Freya and her adds by 50%. Elder Stonebark will increase Freya's physical damage by 50% and give her the Ground Tremor ability which is a 2 second cast that deals a lot of damage to everyone within 100 yards and interrupts spell casts. Elder Iron Branch will increase the physical damage of Freya's adds by 50% and give her the Iron Roots ability, which roots a player and does damage over time to them. These roots need to be killed to release the player, and the player targeted is also able to attack their own roots. The first trash you'll see are the flower packs that contain one Guardian Lasher and a bunch of Forest Swarmers. Swarmers will cast Pollinate on the Guardian Lasher which heals it and gives it a damage buff. This is only a 20 yard range, so you can take the Lasher away from them or you can just try to burst down the Lasher. Pollinate can be interrupted and the buff can be purged. The Swarmers will drop threat constantly. Next you'll see a pack with a variety of mobs. The Ents will heal and cast Hurricane. The Nature's Blades and Guardians will cast a Frontal Cone. Everything in this pack can be interrupted, so spam those interrupts. Make sure you face them away from the raid and move out of Hurricane. The final type of trash pack is a Corrupted Servitor and Misguided Nymph. The Servitor will do instant damage and put a stacking slow on you. He'll also cast an Earthquake ground effect that you just need to move out of. The Nymph will put a shield on that absorbs damage and increases physical damage done by 100%, which should be purged. She'll also cast a Hot that will deal AoE damage if purged. It should be fine to purge it as long as everyone is topped. 
As you go through the area, you'll kill some or all of the elders if you're doing a reduced difficulty. Elder Stonebark will cast Ground Tremor, an AoE that interrupts, and Fists of Stone, which will slow him but increase his damage by 250% and give his attacks a chance on hit to apply the Broken Bones debuff that makes you unable to block, dodge, or parry. You'll want to cat him when he has this up. Elder Brightleaf will cast Thorn Swarm that does damage to a random raid member and people within 6 yards of them, so people should be spread. He also casts Iron Roots on random players, which root and deal damage until the roots are killed. His final ability is Impale, which he uses on the tank and will stun and do about 35k physical damage a second for 5 seconds on 25 man, and about half that on 10 man. You can preemptively use a defensive for this or call for one. Lastly, Elder Brightleaf will cast Sunbeams on the ground, move him out of these as they will heal him. Healers and DPS can stand in them for a stacking damage and healing buff, but they'll take more damage from his unstable energy ability the more stacks they have. They'll also cast Solar Flare and instant AoE. Now for Freya herself. This can be either solo or two tanked on 10 man on any difficulty. On 25 man it's probably solo tankable, but I'd two tank it until everyone has the fight down. If you're using two tanks, one tank will be on Freya the whole time and the other will be on Adds the whole time. She has a passive buff that heals her for 24,000 every second and she'll start with 150 stacks of Attune to Nature, which increases healing done by 8% per stack for 1200% total increased healing. For this reason, damage done to her won't matter at all until later. Killing Adds will remove stacks of her buff, She'll cast Sunbeam on a random player, which does AoE damage to anyone around them. She will periodically summon trees called Gifts of Eonar. These will slowly grow and do an AoE heal when they reach full size. Ranged will be in charge of killing these, but you can help kill them if they happen to spawn near you. If Elder Stonebark is alive, Freya will have the Ground Trimmer ability that will do big AoE damage to the raid. Do whatever you can to assist with raid damage, such as a Divine Sacrifice. If Elder Ironbark is alive, Freya will be casting Iron Roots on random players. DPS will handle these, but if they spawn near you, you can assist with killing them. She'll periodically summon a random group of adds, which can be either a group of three containing a Storm Lasher, Ancient Water Spirit, and Snap Lasher, a group of ten Detonating Lashers, or a single Ancient Conservator. In phase 1, you'll fight each type of ad spawn twice for 6 total ad spawns. The spawn order is random. For the 3 pack, the ad tank will grab the Water Spirit and Storm Lasher. The Water Spirit and Storm Lasher both have AoEs that need to be interrupted, and they're also stunnable. The Snap Lasher will gain a stacking damage buff when it's attacked. It's easiest to have a DK and Frost Presence kite this with Icy Touch and Chains of Ice Spam. If the Freya tank is a DK, they can handle this while tanking Freya. If you don't have a DK with you, just keep the Snap Lasher slowed and you can ping pong it back and forth between tanks or a tank in range DPS by taunting and letting them rip back off of you. All three of these adds need to die at about the same time or they'll res. As for detonating Lashers, these drop aggro constantly and will explode for a lot of fire damage when killed. The entire raid should group up on Freya and AoE them down to about 20% and then you'll want to root them ideally with Frost Nova, and have everyone run towards the entrance to the room. The raid should be prepared to use AoE knockbacks and stuns when the root effect breaks. Rot Warrior's Shockwave is the MVP for this. Once people are a safe distance, they should help finish off the rest of the Lashers. I recommend one or both tanks pop defensives and stay in to finish them off. We found this helped a lot. If healers are prepared for tanks to stay in, there's pretty much no chance of dying to the explosions. Make sure you have Fire Resist Aura or Totem for this, and Aura Mastery it if possible. Having Resist Flasks on your entire raid helps a lot in general for this fight, but especially for this part if any adds get away and die near people. The final type of ad is the Ancient Conservator. You'll see mushrooms start to spawn when he does, and it's important to get under these ASAP. He'll pacify anyone not under a mushroom, so you just won't be able to do anything until you get to one. The mushrooms also give a damage buff, so you can tank future ad waves under mushrooms for the short time that they remain. When tanking the conservator, you can have him in the middle of the mushrooms so that both you and your melee can get the mushroom buff without them having to attack from the front. Mushrooms will slowly grow and then despawn, so look around ahead of time and figure out where the next mushroom you're going to move to is. The range for the mushroom buff is pretty large compared to its model before it grows. 
The Conservator will also put a debuff on a random player that causes them to deal AoE damage to players around them, so these players just need to move away. Once you've killed each of these waves twice, Phase 2 will begin. Phase 2 is the easiest part of the fight and is basically a free kill if you don't hit the Berserk Timer. The Freya tank should move her next to the river. Periodically, she will spawn pods on the ground under players that will blow up after a short time. The entire raid should move across the river each time these pods spawn. The river creates a very clear line of what area is safe and what area isn't. She'll still have all the abilities she had in phase 1, you just won't be dealing with adds anymore. Just keep moving back and forth across the river as the pods spawn, and you should kill her easily. Past Freya's room, you'll find the entrance to Memoron's area. There's a bit of trash here, but it can potentially be skipped by clever rogues that are able to sneak through and pull Memoron to activate the portal. Most people probably won't be skipping this early on though. These trash bags all have bombs in them that explode when they reach someone, so it's good to begin these pulls with a designated person going in first to explode the bombs. For the first pull, this will usually be a pally with divine shield, but there are many possibilities. For subsequent pulls, generally you'll use a mech that you get from the previous pulls. Once the bombs explode, cancel Divine Shield if that's what you chose to use. There are a bunch of mobs that are literally called trash that don't really do anything. The Arachnopod Destroyer has a frontal cone attack, so just keep that faced away. When the Destroyer gets low, the mechanic inside will abandon it and become an attackable mob. The Destroyer will become inactive and friendly, and a player can click on it to hop inside. If you do too much damage, the destroyer will just die though, so when it gets low, you can stop DPS to save it. The mechanic that hops out will try to build tons of turrets that do AoE damage. These mechanics are stunnable and should be stunned and bursted down so they can't create any turrets. The destroyer can be healed up once it's friendly, so a healer should heal it up a bit. The player controlling it can then leap into the next pack to absorb the bombs and act as kind of an off tank. The second pack is similar to the first, but it has Clockwork Sappers in it. When these die, they'll leave behind a glowing white ball on the ground that will slowly get bigger and then explode. This will one-shot people, so try to tank these away so they die away from people and call out for people not to get near them. You'll go through one more trash pack that has the same types of mobs, and then you'll find the tram. If you want to troll your raid, go out onto the ledge and jump up and down and comment about how disappointing it is that there's an invisible wall that won't let you jump off the tram. Then just sit back and watch your fellow raiders fall to their death. Once everyone is on the tram, interact with the console to get sent to Memoron's room. Once you're here, go down the stairs and you'll see a track with bomb bots running across it. These are similar to the slimes after Patchwork and Nax, just dodge them. They are tauntable though. Do with that what you will. Now we're at Memoron. This is a solo tank fight on 10 man normal and hard mode. On 25 man you can solo or 2 tank it on both normal and hard mode. If you're doing the hard mode you need to press the big red button behind Memoron to activate it. This will increase his HP and damage and also cause fire to spawn on a few random players at the beginning of the fight and every 30 seconds after that for the rest of the fight. This fire spreads and will follow the closest person to it. Since we can control where it goes, either have designated people near fire at all times to make sure it moves to good spots, near walls or other fire, or everyone in your raid just has to have a good understanding of how the fire works and kite it if it spawns near them. New fire will still spawn during phase transitions too. So you'll want your whole raid grouped up near existing fire so the new fire stays clumped up. This hard mode becomes extremely difficult if the fires aren't managed well. Each phase on hard mode will also have a new mechanic that puts out fire but has a negative effect on players too. I'll go over these as we go over each phase. Fire Resist Aura or Fire Resist Totem are important to have down for all difficulties and modes of this fight. Ideally, Fire Resist Aura from a Holy Pally so they can Aura Mastery it. When you pull Memoron, he'll do some RP for a little bit, so delay pre-popping things like Divine Plea, or it will actually run out before he's attackable. He'll be hopping into various machines throughout the phases of this fight, so there will be fairly long RP before every phase. In phase 1, he'll be in the Leviathan Siege Engine. The range should be spread out for this phase because he will cast Napalm Shell, a projectile shot at a random ranged player that does high damage and puts a dot on any one hit. The player targeted can dodge this if they're quick. You'll want to tank phase 1 in the middle so it's easy for people to spread out. The main things in this phase tanks need to be worried about are Plasma Blast, Shock Blast, and Proximity Mines. 
Plasma Blast is a 6 second channeled Spellfire attack that is not resistible and does huge damage to the tank every second. You'll want to have the biggest defensive CD available for each one of these. You can also group up multiple smaller defensives. If you're 2 tanking, the other tank should taunt as soon as Plasma Blast is cast. The Plasma Blast damage will still go to the initial tank, but the off tank will be able to absorb Leviathan's melee attacks to slightly reduce the Plasma Blast tank's damage taken. The first tank should then wait to taunt back until the second tank gets Plasma Blasted so they can use their own big defensive CD. You can just keep trading it back and forth like this to ensure there's always a good defensive CD available for the Plasma Blast tank. When it isn't your turn to take a Plasma Blast, you can also help the Plasma Blast tank with things like Hand of Sacrifice, Talented Intervene, or Lay on Hands. Proximity Mines are thrown out in a circle around Leviathan. Occasionally, he'll cast Shock Blast, which has a 5 second cast but will do 100k damage to anyone within 15 yards. It's important to look at the mine placement beforehand so you already know what path you're going to take to get away from the Shock Blast without triggering any mines. Once Shock Blast goes off, just get back into melee range and reposition him in the middle if necessary. If you're doing hard mode, he will cast Flame Suppressant once, which will extinguish fires and slow the raid's casting speed for a short time. For Phase 2, Memoron will be in the VX, which is a stationary cannon with no threat table. You don't need to tank anything in this phase. This is generally considered to be the hardest part of the fight on hard mode, so you'll want to lust here. Raid damage taken will be extremely high in this phase. Everyone should be spread out because he'll constantly be shooting a cone attack on random targets. He'll also frequently cast Heat Wave, which does a large amount of initial fire damage, and then more every second for 5 seconds. He casts this a lot, and you'll want to have raid defensives popped for as many as you can. You should have a Divine Sacrifice and Aura Mastery rotation figured out for this beforehand to minimize raid damage. Rocket Strike is another ability he will use that creates red circles on the ground that players need to move out of. Players who don't move out will be hit for 5 million damage. His final ability in Phase 2 is Laser Barrage. He'll first cast Spinning Up and then use Laser Barrage on the area he's facing and slowly rotate. This is exactly like Dark Lair on C'Thun. Just move away from his front when he's doing this. Since there's nothing to tank in this phase, you can just DPS and assist the raid with healing or whatever else you're able to do as needed. If you're doing the hard mode, focus on guiding the fire away from the melee. During hard mode, VX will also cast Frost Bomb, which throws a huge blue bomb in an area that will explode and extinguish fires. It will also deal 50,000 damage to any player within 30 yards. The range on this is huge, so people need to be very far away. In Phase 3, Memoron will get into the Aerial Command Unit. This has a normal threat table, but it's also flying out of melee range, which makes tanking it more difficult. On PTR, we were able to auto-attack it while it was in the air, but I'm not sure if this is intentional. DKs can go Frost Presence and spam Icy Touch on this to hold aggro, or a designated range DPS can tank it. It can also be taunted. A few types of adds will spawn during this phase. If you have Plater or another nameplate add-on that allows for it, I recommend you change the nameplate colors of the various adds so it's easy to see what you need to pick up when there are tons of adds all over. The most notable add is the Assault Bot, which you don't want to face tank on 25-man without defensive cooldowns up, but on 10-man it's usually fine to face tank him. This thing hits harder than raid bosses and will occasionally put a cleansable debuff on the tank that increases their damage taken and roots them. This should be cleansed immediately or the tank can be one shot. Assault bots can be slowed and stunned and you should get them tricked and MD'd to you so you don't have to be in melee range to hold threat. Use ranged abilities as you kite them such as Icy Touch and Exorcism. Once an assault bot is killed, it can be looted by anyone to get an electromagnet. Use this under the aerial command unit to bring it down to the ground, and it will take 50% more damage for a short time. Junk bots are another add you should pick up, but they don't do too much damage. Both the assault bots and junk bots will spawn out of one of the nine circles on the ground around the room. Bomb bots will spawn out of the aerial command unit, and range should focus these down immediately. You can have a DK grip them away from people too, and they are slowable. If you're doing hard mode, there will be a fourth type of ad, the Emergency Fire Bot. These do not need to be tanked, they'll just run to the nearest fire and shoot a water jet at it to put it out. You do have to be careful with these because their water jet does huge conal damage and a knockback to anyone in front. They also have an aura that silences anyone within 15 yards of them. 
Just stay away from the fire and they shouldn't really get near you. You can kill some of them if you need to once they've put out a good amount of the fire. They'll also stick around into phase 4 unless you kill them. When phase 4 begins, all of the machines from the previous phases will combine into Voltron. Each machine from the previous phases still has its own health bar, and all three need to die within 10 seconds of one another. You'll need to tank the bottom one, and I've found it pretty easy to tank the top one as well as a prop pally. Just taunt the top one anytime you need to, and you should be able to hold threat pretty well with cleave abilities. DK Icy Touch Spam can again hold the top one well too. Melee will be able to attack the bottom and middle section, but not the top. Each section of Voltron will keep some, but not all of their abilities from the previous phases. The bottom one will use Shock Blast and Proximity Mines. The middle one will use Rapid Burst, Rocket Strike, Laser Barrage, and Water Bomb. And the top one will just spam Plasma Ball, his basic attack. People should stay spread out for this phase and keep managing the fire. Reposition Voltron as needed based on fire locations. This phase really isn't too bad as long as people are paying attention to the one-shot mechanics. Once you've killed all the keepers, the door to Vizax's area will open up between the entrance to Memoron's area and the area you fought Kolagarn. Take the portal to the Shattered Walkway to get here fast. You'll see a pack of humanoids as you enter. They can be grouped up and AoE down, but they do a decent amount of AoE damage. The Shadow Blades will poison all of the melee, so just have Poison Cleansing Totem down. The Slayer will Bladestorm and Mortal Strike, the Guardian will Thunderclap, Stun and Sunder, and the Adherent will Fear and Heal. Focus Adherence down first. You can use Divine Sacrifice here to help reduce raid damage. Next, you'll fight a Faceless Horror. This will mind control a random person, they just need to be CC'd. You'll also cast Shadow Crash, which is a projectile that range need to dodge. At 50%, he'll go immune and summon a Void Beast. Once the Void Beast dies, it will explode for a small amount of damage and knock back anyone hit, and the Faceless Horror will lose his immunity. Head downstairs and drop down to the right side, and you'll see some large packs of humanoids and elementals. Just group all of these up and AoE them down. Anyone with an interrupt should help interrupt to get them grouped up. Focus down Adherence first again. After the middle humanoid pack is killed, the right Faceless Horror will patrol forward, and once the left humanoid group is killed, the left Faceless Horror will patrol forward. We start on the right side to create more space. General Vizax is a solo tank fight on normal on both 10 and 25 man. On hard mode, he can either be solo or two tanked on 10 man, and two tanked on 25 man, though he will likely be solo tankable once players are geared. He has an aura that both disables most mana regen and reduces melee attack speed by 20%. Prop Allies can steal regen mana from Spiritual Attunement, Blessing of Sanctuary, and Glyph of Seal of Command. As a Prop Pally, I used this spec to solo tank 10-man hard mode and had no mana issues at all. He has a few other spells, Surge of Darkness, Searing Flames, Mark of the Faceless, and Shadow Crash. Surge of Darkness is the main one we care about. He'll cast this every minute and get a plus 100% damage buff for 10 seconds. It'll also reduce his movement speed if you want to kite him, but I recommend standing still and using defensives for this. It'll be a lot easier for your ranged if you're not moving around at all. Searing Flames is an interruptible cast that does huge AoE damage to the raid and reduces armor by 75%. This should always be interrupted. Mark of the Faceless we don't have to worry about, but this will place a debuff on a random raid member that steals health from everyone near the target and heals Vizax. It's important that there's always a 50% healing reduction debuff on Vizax at all times. Side note, we tried Furious Attacks and the uptime is terrible. Do not use this for your healing debuff. Shadow Crash we also don't really have to worry about, but you will fire this at a random ranged player. It will do AoE damage where it lands and create a puddle. The puddle increases magic damage done and cast speed while also reducing healing done and mana cost. Between this buff and the tank having reduced attack speed, the raid may actually need to use some threat reduction abilities for once. Keep an eye on threat and get Hand of Salves out if necessary. Serenite Vapors will periodically spawn around the room. If you're doing hard mode, do not kill these. They cannot be hit by AoE, so don't worry about things like Hammer of the Righteous or Consecration when these float near you. If you're not doing hard mode, DPS can kill these and people can get mana back from them. Once eight of them spawn and are not killed, they'll merge together and spawn the Serenite Animus. This will spawn right on top of Vizax. Just pick it up and kill it ASAP. 
It will melee you and spam Profound Darkness, which deals shadow damage to the whole raid and applies a stagging debuff that increases shadow damage taken by 10%. Once the Animus is dead, just kill VZAX and you've completed hard mode. This is probably the most boring tank fight in the game, so bring a crossword or something. Now for Yogg-Saron. This fight has five different difficulty levels depending on how many keepers you choose to have active. To activate a keeper, just talk to them at the observation ring and they'll move down to Yogg's room. Each keeper has its own buff and mechanic. Memoron will give players plus 20% move speed and reduce the attack speed of tentacles by 100% and cast speed by 300%. Freya will increase all healing received on players by 20% and spawn sanity wells at the sides of the room that players can enter to regenerate their sanity. This is the only way to restore sanity. Odir will reduce damage taken for players by 20% and when a player dies they have a chance to instead be encased in ice and saved. Thorum will increase player health by 20% and kill immortal guardians when they get low HP. This is the only way to kill immortal guardians. I expect most people will do this fight with one keeper active, aka Yogg-1, since this gives hard mode loot. If you're doing Yogg-1, you want Thorum to be your active keeper, as dealing with the Immortal Guardians is the hardest part of the fight, and he trivializes them. The most difficult mode of this encounter is with Zero Keepers, aka Yogg-0, and will drop a mount on 25-man and a tentacle on use trinket on 10-man. For Yogg 1 to 4, this can be solo or 2 tanked on both 10 and 25 man, but I recommend solo tanking it. For Yogg 0, this can be solo or 2 tanked on 10 man, and early on it will need to be 2 tanked on 25 man, but should be solo tankable once people are geared. You'll want to wear your tankiest set possible for Yogg 0. One of the core mechanics of this fight is sanity. You'll start with 100 sanity and can lose sanity from various mechanics throughout the fight. If your sanity reaches zero, you'll go insane, which mind controls you and increases damage done by 100% and health by 300%. When the duration expires, the player dies, so it's important to never lose all of your sanity. The fight will start pretty much as soon as you go past the door, so be prepared. In phase one, you'll see Sarah in the middle of the room, head over to her and wait for a guardian to spawn out of the yellow clouds floating around the room. When these guardians die, they deal a large amount of shadow damage to everyone near them, including Sarah. Phase one will end when eight guardians have been killed next to Sarah. They spawn naturally over time, but if a player touches a yellow cloud, another guardian will spawn in addition to the regularly scheduled one. If you want to speed up phase 1, you can intentionally trigger more spawns, but be careful you don't trigger too many. You can tell if a guardian is going to spawn out of a cloud because a big yellow ball will appear on top of that cloud. They have an interruptible cast called Dark Volley that deals AoE damage to the entire raid and reduces healing received, so it's important to interrupt all of these. Melee needs to be very careful getting in and out on the guardians due to both the Shadow Nova and the potential to trigger more guardians if they touch a cloud. Some guilds may choose to just have melee not even go in at all. Sarah will occasionally put random debuffs on players. Sarah's fervor will increase damage done by 20%, but also damage taken by 100%. If you get this, you'll need to pop a defensive CD to survive the Shadow Nova. Sarah's blessing heals a player, but also applies a Shadow Dot. Sarah's anger will also put a Shadow Dot on a player and increase physical damage done. Sarah's Fervor is the main one to keep an eye on, but you could potentially use a smaller damage reduction cooldown for the others. Once Sarah has been hit with 8 Shadow Novas, Phase 2 will begin. You may still have a Guardian or two left over. If there are any yellow Guardian spawn balls active when the phase transition happens, they will still spawn, so keep an eye out for them. In Phase 2, Yogg-Saron will appear with Sarah floating above him. Sarah will randomly cast Psychosis, Brain Link, Malady of the Mind, and Death Ray. Psychosis deals instant damage and reduces sanity. Brain Link will link two random players together and cause them to take shadow damage and lose sanity while more than 20 yards apart. If a player enters a portal, the Brain Link will be severed. Malady of the Mind will horrify the target like Death Coil and drain sanity and deal damage. The effect will hop to a new player when the effect expires if anyone is within 10 yards. Death Ray is a slow moving beam that you just need to dodge. Periodically, portals will spawn around Yogg. As tanks, we don't need to worry about these, but some of your DPS and possibly a healer will be assigned to specific portals. 
These portals take them to a random event, Yogg Influence in Warcraft History, and they need to kill some mobs and then enter Yogg's brain room and DPS it down. This is the only way to damage Yogg in Phase 2, and the phase will end when he reaches 30%. While Yogg's brain is being attacked, all tentacles outside will be stunned. Three types of tentacles will spawn in Phase 2. Pressure tentacles, corruptor tentacles, and constrictor tentacles. Our primary job is going to be dealing with crusher tentacles. These hit hard and gain a stacking attack speed and damage buff when they're attacked. If they aren't hit with a melee attack for a little bit, they'll start channeling diminished power, which puts a stacking minus 20% damage debuff on the entire raid. Our job is to not let diminished power happen while also staying alive. Allies can sit out of melee range and interrupt diminished power with judgment. If you're going into melee range of a crusher, make sure it has low stacks of the damage buff. You can make sure all stacks drop by having DPS stop for a couple seconds if you need to. If a player gets maladied near a crusher, to save them you can either go into melee range with a defensive if stacks are high, bop them if you're a pally, or have someone else prepared to bop them. Corruptor tentacles will cast Curse of Doom, Apathy, Black Plague, and Draining Poison. All of these can be removed. Corruptor tentacles are also stunnable. Curse of Doom will do damage after 12 seconds, just needs to be decursed. Apathy will reduce attack, movement, and casting speed, and just needs a magic to spell. Black Plague periodically stuns and needs a disease cleanse. Draining Poison is a dot that burns mana and deals damage and needs to be poison cleansed. Prop Pally should look to help out with cleanses as much as possible. Constrictor tentacles will pick up a random player and deal high physical damage to them every second. These are stunnable and the players picked up can be bopped. Once your brain team has brought the brain down to 30%, phase 3 will begin. In phase 3, Yogg frequently casts Lunatic Gaze, which will deal damage and drain sanity while players are facing towards him. Just move so you're facing away from him to avoid this, but you'll generally be tanking adds with your back to Yogg anyway. Your primary job in this phase is picking up Immortal Guardians that spawn. These have pretty much no delay between the time they spawn and when they start attacking people, so be quick on your taunts. These will spawn in random spots around the room, so keep an eye out. Tank these on the melee stack next to Yogg so Cleave hits them. They deal more damage the higher their HP is, so damaging them will reduce your damage taken. They'll cast Drain Life to heal, but this can be interrupted. If you have Thorum active, he will kill them when they get to 1% HP. But if you don't have Thorum active, they'll never die and you'll be tanking more and more Immortal Guardians until the fight is over. When 2 tanking, tanks should alternate ad pickups so there's an even number of adds on each tank. Yogg will occasionally send a Shadow Beacon at random Guardians and the number of Guardians chosen will increase each time. After 10 seconds, the Shadow Beacon will land and put a huge heal over time on the target and any other mob within 20 yards. These hots stack and can be applied to both Yogg and the Guardians. If Thorum is active, this isn't a huge deal as Guardians are likely to die before they even get the hot. Just make sure any Guardians targeted for Shadow Beacons are away from Yogg so he doesn't get healed if the Guardian won't die in time. Since the Guardian's damage is based on their HP, these hots will drastically increase the damage of Guardians. To deal with this when Thorum isn't active, Players will need to be assigned a mark to taunt a guardian out of the group so that they can be separated and each beacon only puts a hot on the one guardian that was targeted for it. On 10 man we found the DPS check for Yogg Zero wasn't very high so we opted to skip taunting out the shadow beacons. Instead I just tanked them away from Yogg so he wouldn't get healed and chain popped defensive cooldowns once they were healed and doing a lot more damage. Once I was out of defensives, I rocket booted away from the raid to buy them time to finish Yogg. Finally, let's talk about Algalon. He is a hard mode only boss in the antechamber and can be found across from the hallway that led you to Iron Council. The only trash you have to clear to get to him is one chamber overseer. However, someone in your group has to have the Celestial Planetarium key, which is obtained by completing the Archivum data disk quest chain from Iron Council medium or hard mode. This chain requires you to kill all four keepers of Ulduar on hard mode. Once you engage Algalon, you'll only have one hour to kill him before he despawns, so you really need to make the most of your time and get pulls in quickly. I recommend taking a short break before Algalon to make sure nobody has to go AFK during the one hour time limit. People can also take time to enchant and gem their new gear to make sure your raid is at full power when you start the one hour timer. Early in phase 2, it is very likely you'll use up the entire hour and still won't kill him. 
This is a two tank fight on 10 and a two to three tank fight on 25 man and is hard mode only. It should eventually be possible to solo tank him on 10 man too. Algalon is by far the hardest hitting boss in Old War, so you'll want to gear for as much survivability as you can, specifically stamina armor. He dual wields and has a high damaging instant attack called Quantum Strike that he spams. He does not parry haste. If you played TBC, the tank damage on this fight is similar to Brutalis and Sunwell. Click the console next to Algalon's door to open it. Algalon will be neutral every time you pull him, and he will become unattackable for about 27 seconds while he RPs the first pull of the week, and for 7.5 seconds in any subsequent pulls. Make sure both the main tank and off tank pre-pot indestructible pots before the pull. If you have any abilities that proc survivability buffs for you, such as Shield Slam with the Blocking Glyph for Prot Warriors or Judgment with the Librum of Obstruction for Prot Pallies, you can start the encounter with these so that you have these buffs already active when the 7.5 second unattackable phase ends and he starts attacking you. You'll only get to use one GCD ability on him while he's neutral, but you can combo it with an off GCD ability such as Hand of Reckoning for Prot Pallies to get extra threat going into the fight. As soon as Algalon engages, make sure debuffs are put up immediately to reduce his damage. You can tank him in the middle for a bit. Collapsing stars will spawn and one range DPS should be assigned to kill these. They lose health over time on their own and the whole raid will take big damage every time one of these is killed, including the tank. The person in charge of these needs to manage the kills well because poorly timed kills can kill tanks and other raid members. You'll want to have someone assigned to Divine Sacrifice right before each one of these dies. The Star Killer should keep track of raid tags and call out whose turn it is to use one a few seconds before the star will die. These stars will also drop a black hole on the ground wherever they're killed which will phase anyone who touches them into the Shadow Realm. We want to be mindful of where we're tanking Algalon in relation to collapsing stars, because melee cleave can cause stars to die unpredictably, and if a star dies on melee, it will drop the black hole on them and phase them out. Algalon will cast Phase Punch on the tank every 15 seconds, which stacks up to 5. At 5 stacks, the tank will be phased into the Shadow Realm for a short time. Anytime you get phased, either through Phase Punch or entering a black hole, your threat will be wiped. Algalon is tauntable, so the other tank just needs to taunt when Phase Punch reaches 4 stacks to ensure a clean tank swap. Make sure you're letting the healers know when a tank swap is coming up and give them a countdown for the swap. You may want to pop a defensive CD right before you taunt to help out the healers as they're switching over. While tanking Algalon, you should pretty much always have some sort of defensive CD active, whether it's a trinket, personal, or raid CD. Whichever tank is not currently tanking can also use things like Hand of Sacrifice, Lay on Hands, or Talented Intervene on the tank. I always throw Hand of Sack on the off tank right before they taunt off me, so they don't need to use one of their own CDs for a little bit. Cosmic Smash is an ability that creates a red circle effect on the ground, similar to Void Zone. Players need to move away from this, or they'll take a lot of damage and be knocked in the air. The damage it does is based on distance, but as long as you're about 10 yards away, you won't take damage. This effect can be hard to see around the boss when there's things like Death and Decay and lots of melee stacked up. If you get targeted with Cosmic Smash while main tanking, try to move sideways to get away from it instead of backwards. Melee will just follow the boss wherever you move it and may run straight into a Cosmic Smash if you just move backwards. Call out anytime Cosmic Smash is cast on you to help out the melee. After about a minute, constellations will become active. These have a normal aggro table, so they'll be going for healers most likely. They do an arcane barrage that does a small amount of damage. These will despawn when they go into a black hole, and will consume the black hole in the process. Whichever tank is not currently tanking Algalon needs to be picking these up and kiting them into black holes to take them out of the fight. Like with Memoron, I recommend changing the nameplate colors of the adds you don't care about with Plater or a similar nameplate add-on. I changed my collapsing star nameplate to green since I don't need to worry about picking these up. Constellations are slowable and stunnable. There are several tricks to getting these into black holes. You can simply kite them in if you have enough distance, or you can allow them to sit on a healer for a second, move to the other side of a black hole, and taunt them across. Or you can take it to one side of a black hole with healers on the other side, knowing their healing aggro will rip it back. Or you can slow it or nitro to allow you to get some space to the other side of the black hole. The black holes near walls can be particularly annoying, but you can stun a constellation on one side, then move to the other side and taunt when the stun ends. DKs can also grip them. 
If someone with a knockback happens to be in a good spot too, you can call for a knockback to just knock the constellation into a black hole. You can also move near a black hole and run straight into it for Big Bang and the constellation will follow you in and close it behind you. You just have to be careful that you aren't closing a black hole that someone intended to use to avoid the Big Bang. When Big Bang is coming up, the main tank should move the boss close to a black hole if there are none nearby, so that both the tank and melee can get into one easily for Big Bang. If everyone is across the room from the nearest black hole, it is likely they'll all die unless they rocket boot. This fight is a DPS race, so maximize damage and enter the black hole when Big Bang has about 2 seconds left. You want to aim for the center of the black hole to reliably get teleported. Every 90 seconds, Algalon will cast Big Bang, which is an AoE dealing about 100,000 damage to anyone not in the Shadow Realm. At this point, the entire raid except for one person needs to go inside a black hole to avoid the attack. Generally, a Shadow Priest is chosen for this because they can use Dispersion to tank the damage. Be mindful of any constellations still alive while people are trying to use the black holes to escape Big Bang, because you may accidentally close one as people are trying to use it, which will lead to them dying. Everyone should avoid the adds as much as they can, but you can try to keep them off of people if they aren't avoiding them. Once Big Bang is finished, everyone will be transported back out of the Shadow Realm. The Shadow Realm is just another phase of the same place that you've been fighting Algalon the whole time. It's important when you're in the Shadow Realm you're aware of where the black holes were outside. If you're standing in an area that has a black hole in the normal realm, you'll just be put right back into the Shadow Realm when Big Bang ends. Red is wiped anytime you enter the Shadow Realm, so when you come out, whoever is supposed to be tanking Algalon needs to taunt him. Whoever stayed out will still retain all of their threat, so the taunt will give a huge threat lead over everyone except that person. I like to taunt and stay at a bit of distance, so he has to run a little bit to me and healers get some extra time to set back up on me. If you run right back into him immediately, you may just get gibbed because healers aren't ready yet. You'll be repeating all of this over and over until 20%, when all collapsing stars, constellations, and black holes will despawn, and four new black holes will spawn near the middle. Make sure nobody is in the areas these will spawn. At around 25-30%, to 30%, the off tank and the star killer should start deciding how worthwhile it is to continue doing their add duties, and instead possibly just burn Algalon to push the phase. The star killer needs to be certain that multiple collapsing stars won't go off together before they despawn at 20%. The off-tank handling constellations can just tank them for a bit and help DPS Algalon if there aren't any nearby worthwhile black holes to throw them in. Adds will spawn out of the four black holes at 20% that the off-tank will need to pick up and bring on top of Algalon to get cleaved down. It's ideal if you can do the final tank swap of the fight before these adds spawn so you don't have to worry about the adds while doing the tank swap. The fight ends when Algalon reaches about 3%. This final phase is very easy, so I recommend using your Bloodlust at the very beginning of the fight. Alright, that should hopefully cover everything you need to know about tanking in Old War. If you found this guide helpful, liking, commenting, and subscribing really helps me out. I've got links to my Twitch and Discord in the description. Thank you for watching, and good luck in Old War.